Welcome to The Pop Revolution, the show where we dive into a new song every single month, show you how it's made from beginning to end, writing all the way to production. I'm your host, Nathan Larson, and this is the very final episode for the month of October. So we'll be wrapping it all up today with this month's tune, Vesperu. Here we go. If you like that little ditty, but have not yet seen the music video or heard the tune, be sure to check that out right here. You can also watch the most recent episode right here, and the links for all the rest of this month's episodes are in the description down below. In this final episode, we'll be talking about synthetic synthesized synthesizers. Synths don't play a massive role in this tune, but it would be super noticeable if they were removed. The synth parts don't rip out big and epic lead lines, but instead they're pretty much entirely subdued pulsing synths that just add texture. The ability to create layers is one of the things I absolutely love about studio production. In a live setting, unless you have either a huge band or backing tracks, there's really no way you can create so many different layers and textures. But in the studio, there are literally no limits. You're able to follow your gut and really serve the music better by being able to create multiple different layers and textures. I'm not saying there isn't value in performing music without those layers, but I definitely love being able to create them whenever possible. In this tune, I actually only used one synth engine, and it's personally one of my favorites. It's Output's Pulse Engine Signal. This baby is one of the coolest libraries I've ever used. It makes creating pulsing synths so stinking easy, and it is super easy to manipulate the sounds they have to create your own. It's intuitive and very unique. Basically, I love this thing. Here's what the intro sounds like with only synths playing and nothing else. As you can hear, they aren't doing anything insane or intrusive. They're simply creating a layer for everything else to sit on. Without the synths, it sounds a lot more hollow. Of course, there are times when having soaring synth leads are totally called for, but in this style, it would definitely be intrusive and problematic. Whether you're using high quality synths like Massive, FM8, Reactor, Amog, or any other synth library or synth keyboard, you can create really awesome textures with all of them. Whether you need a pad or a soft pulsing synth, you need to learn how to do that with whatever you have. Synths can be super intimidating, but I found that experimenting and watching people as they shape synths is super helpful. I also don't in any way claim to be a synth expert. In fact, using synths is probably my biggest weakness as a producer, but I'm continuing to push myself as an artist to learn more and more about using them. Let's skip ahead to the transition where I can show Show you one of the other synth parts I used to help create a different texture. I said in the previous episode that one of the ways to help your arrangement feel fresh is to either add new instruments or take away instruments in new sections to help create a new sonic texture or vibe. In this case, I did both. I scaled back the arrangement by taking out electric piano and celesta, but I scaled it up, so to speak, by adding a faster pulse that really helps give additional energy to this section. I wanted this section to feel like it was building up tension. That's why the pedal tone works, why the drums they are the way they are, and why this synth helps to accomplish this vibe I wanted. I wanted an energy that felt subdued, like it was wanting to be released, but wasn't there yet. When the B section finally happens where everything explodes, I take out the synths because I wanted this to have a more kind of rock-like sound. Guitar, piano, bass, drums take over and just jam. The synths come back in at the outro and they are the same patches as I used in the intro to bring back that texture that is familiar from the beginning. Yet again, the arrangement ebbs and flows as I put these new sounds in and take old ones out and vice versa. Take advantage of similarities to bring back things you've done to give you a sense of familiarity. If you want constant change, then constantly use new sounds, new instruments, or constantly switch up your combinations. 
is the most simple way to keep new life in your arrangements. Well, that's pretty much all there is for synths, so here are a few final thoughts I did not have time for individual episodes for before we wrap up this month. Let's quickly talk about the vocals to start. In this song, I really used vocals more as a pad-like instrument, and then layered them in multiple times. Check this out. As you can hear in this section, the vocals are definitely more prominent as they are what really helps transition into the jam section. In my mind, using vocals in this way to add an additional layer is really appealing. I'm a big fan of using the voice to create cool harmonies underneath everything. There's something intimate about the human voice that really no other instrument has. You can hear the breathiness and the specific vowel shapes that can really add a really fantastic texture to work with. As far as how I track this, it was just recording myself several times over until I felt like like the effect was working. Normally, I found that three voices per part tends to work well, and anything more than that will only help your sound. So, if you're wanting to create vocal pad sounds like this, it's all about layering your voice several times. Beyond that, I created a bus for reverb, which was a much larger reverb. This helps make the vocals sound a bit bigger and have more resonance due to the space it sounds like they're in. Another little trick with using vocal pads is utilizing EQ to create a specific tonal character. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to really dive into the mixing process as much in this series, so I'm hoping to be able to put out a few extras where I talk more about mixing specifically. In this song, I cut a lot of the low end of the vocals and also did a very light and wide boost in the higher range from the 2K to 5K which adds to the breathiness and it helps make the vocals stick out a bit. However, in the vast majority of circumstances, I don't normally boost EQ. I do more of a subtractive EQ approach, which means that I take away frequencies to give the impression of more of other frequencies. Like I said, I'm hoping to be able to put out more extras that dive into some of these things in the future. Another piece of this puzzle are smaller transitions. These transitions aren't the transitions we've already talked about in previous episodes that help move one entire section to the next. Instead, these smaller sections are how I make either repeating a small section or going into a new section more interesting in the measure leading up to it. Here's an example. Right before the drums come in and that idea repeats with the band, you get a swelling texture that really helps make getting into the repeat more interesting. Another thing it does is makes it so that when the drums and bass come in, it doesn't feel abrupt in any way. That additional swell really makes you anticipate something more, and the drums and bass coming in are that moment. For these moments, I try to be as creative as possible. In this particular example, I simply used vocals that outlined a triad and I performed it to sound as breathy and dynamic as possible so it felt a little bit more like a swell. Additionally, I used strings, reverse piano, and a cymbal with soft mallets. Here's how it sounds with nothing but the transition instruments playing. As you can see, it's not super complex. It's all about finding creative combinations. I've used reverse electric guitars, tremolo violins, synth pads with automated EQ, and white noise that has automated EQ, and much more. All of these things are possibilities of what you can do, and of course, as I've said, experimentation is your friend. Be creative. Huh. I feel like I've said that before. Here's the other smaller transition that uses a similar approach. Finally, let's talk a bit about strings. I already mentioned how I use them in the transition, but I also use them at the very end quite a bit more. To start off here, I'd just like to say this is something I can make an entire episode on, so trying to squeeze it in here is really not ideal, but it's going to have to work, so I'll be blowing through this very fast. For my string samples, I use East West Quantum Leap's Hollywood Strings Library, which is an incredibly well done library. If you're looking for high quality orchestral libraries, East West is definitely a great solution. I'll also often use Native Instruments Session Strings Pro, but it really just depends on the type of sound I'm going for. Here Here's the section we're going to be talking about. And here's what it sounds like with nothing but the strings and piano. The cat 
Really, what's awesome about strings is that they sound amazing doing practically anything. I could have literally just written simple chords, taken out some of the suspensions and little melodic figures, and it still would just sound incredible. Strings are literally some of the most beautiful instruments out there. So if you have access to live players or really great samples, take advantage of it. In a style like this song, ending with strings is really the icing on the cake. And everyone knows that icing is the most important part of the cake. The rest is kind of just there. One thing I can say is that when you're working with sampled strings, you need to be very intentional about dynamics. In this particular example, I could get away with a bit less attentiveness simply because the section isn't calling for anything magnificent. But I still was using automated modulation to add dynamics to these parts so they didn't sound stagnant. If you're using libraries that don't have modulation controls for dynamics, then just use volume automation. It doesn't work quite as well, but it can give the impression of a more dynamic part. I honestly really wish I had more time to dive into how this string parts work together to be a bit more interesting, but we are certainly out of time. As I said before, this was the last episode of this month's series, so if you've not watched any of the other episodes, you should definitely do that. As said, links are in the description below. I'm super excited for this upcoming month of November. On November 1st, we'll be releasing our newest song and music video for you to enjoy before we hit the ground running on that next series. In this upcoming series, I'm excited because we will have our very first collaborative artist joining us, Brittany Downey. She's one of our featured artists on this tune, and she's also the co-writer for this song, and she wrote lyrics. She's a talented singer-songwriter, so I'm so stoked to start that new series next week. Of course, make sure to subscribe to continue being a part of what we're doing here at The Pop Revolution. We'd also love to hear from you, so leave any questions or comments you have down below in the comments section. You can also buy this last song on iTunes, right here so you can have it with you everywhere you go. This also helps us continually make new content for you to enjoy and is a great way to show your support. And that, my friends, is a wrap. Peace out. <laughs>